Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, your creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. It's like Groundhog Day. It, it does feel like it. Hello, everybody. I hope you're fantastic and I love you all. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadian schmoes. Schmoes. Chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and a Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Chomp, chomp, chomp. <laughs> Listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the Crisis Text Line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868. In the US or UK, text 741741. The service will match you with a volunteer counsellor who is supervised by a licensed, trained mental health professional. Crisis Text Line is free 24-7 support for those in crisis. For more information, go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org globally. While Scott is over there chomping... Uh, I am so glad that we had somebody else write this episode for us. Yes. Yeah. So, somebody we know. Yeah. Josina Debris. She did such a fine job writing episode 137, the Hillcrest mining disaster, that when she offered to write another one for us, I jumped on it right away. And she has done another bang up job of a really weird story. Josie is good people and I'm super stoked that we have her in our corner and writing episodes. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Josina. On June 13th, 1901, Ada Mills Redpath and her son, Jocelyn Clifford Redpath, were killed in their mansion on Sherbrooke Street in Montreal. Ada had been shot in the back of the head. Clifford had a gunshot to his temple. The police were not called. A coroner's inquest the next day declared the deaths a murder-suicide. Ada and Clifford were buried on June 15th without any further investigation. This is Dark Poutine episode 146, the story of the Red Path Mansion mystery. I can understand murder-suicide. You've got uh, one in the back of the head, one in the temple. Sounds like murder-suicide to me. And police were not called, but... uh... Yeah. How could they be called, Mike? It was 1901. How do you call I'm them? I'm pretty sure there were phones then. 1901? I don't know. I guarantee there it, was. 911 smoke signals were sent up. 911 right. carrier pigeons. Carrier pigeons. Were, were distributed. <laughs> or someone sent a pony. <laughs> because that's what they used to do. John Redpath and his family arrived in Montreal from England mm-hmm. in 1816. He made money working on construction projects, including the Rideau Canal, which was to provide passage between Kingston and Montreal in the event of an attack from the United States. Oh, America. Well, you know, we weren't on the best terms with them in the early 1800s, seeing as we burned their White House in 1812. Well, I mean, it had to happen. I guess we turned it into the charred house. (laughs) Yeah. Oops. Sorry, it was 200 years ago. Get over it, guys. Get over it. 
1836, John Redpath purchased 235 acres on Mount Royal. Can you imagine what that would be worth today? Mount Royal in Montreal, 235 acres. Dear God. Billions. Uh, Damn near, like for real. Yeah. He built a mansion for his family, then subdivided and sold off the rest of the land. The money from the land sales was used to start Canada's first sugar refinery, Red Path Sugar. Mm. And we've all seen that. Mm. Uh, why are you? Mm. Mm. No. Sugar. Oh, yeah. Scott and Sugar are closely acquainted. We're related. He's married to Sugar. Yeah, I just, I ingest sugar. Like, well, like a sugar. John Redpath had seven children with his first wife, Janet McPhee. The youngest, John James, was born January 13th, 1934. Janet passed away six months later from cholera. In 1835, 39-year-old John Redpath married 19-year-old Jane Drummond. They had 10 children together. So there were 17 children in this family. In a 20-year age gap there. Uh, Back then. Poor Jane is all I'm saying. 10 kids. Yeah. That's just, that's a lot of pregnancy. I'm wondering if they might have been a religion that, did not practice any kind of uh, birth control. What did they have back then? An actual sponge you put up your hoo hoo. <sighs> like there, there's they, like there's not a lot of other ways to get around uh, other than abstinence back then. I'm pretty sure if you do some homework, you'll find that that's not the case. I don't want to do that homework. No, I know you don't. In 1867, John James Redpath, so the youngest of the first seven children. Married Ada Maria Mills, the daughter of former Montreal Mayor Major John Mills. They had five children, Amy, Peter, Reginald, Harold, and Jocelyn, who was a boy and went by his middle name Clifford. So sometimes in olden days, people had names that might be reserved for males or females today, or, Mm -hmm. you know, my grandfather's name was Courtney. Oh, And his brother's name was Carmen, and they were born in the 1800s. And today, those are mostly female names. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is just a lot of children being popped out here, though, so far. It really was. Ten and five and then seven early. Like, this is just a constant flurry of children. This five is from the youngest son. It's not like... But it's just children's galore in this episode so far. Lots of babies. Yeah, babies aplenty. The family lived in a mansion at 1065 Sherbrooke Street West, in an elite area known as the Square Mile. The house, which sat on about an acre of land, was designed by prominent architect John James Brown, with an E on the end. That's that's a great name. The Brown with an E on the end? I think that's fantastic. John John James Brown. I'm just thinking, that sounds like... you, you, Michael Christopher Brown? (laughs) That's all right. That's all right. Right. That, that, that just sounds like, like uh, I, f- I was a pop star in the 90s. Well, my grandfather's name was Courtney Tremaine Brown. Oh, my dear God. Isn't that a great name? That is the Tremaine. name. That is the name. Yeah. Wow. So this Victorian mansion was described as a handsome villa erected on the corner of Redpath and Sherbrooke Streets, cut of stone, two stories in height with basement and mansard roof. The portico to entrance is very effective. Mm having four Corinthian columns, pilasters, and cornice with cantilever slate roof. Balcony to second story with ornamental iron railing. The interior is planned with every comfort and convenience and something that Mike Brown and Scott Hemingway will never be able to afford. <laughs> no, but if there's one thing you know about me, Mike, and you're always saying this, is that I love myself an effective entrance. You really do. I really I, do. You appreciate an effective entrance. Like, like, like it's nobody's business. It's very feng shui. It really is. Yeah. And effective. It's effectively feng, feng shui. For an entrance. For an entrance yeah. it is, yeah. And, and some entrances can be not so. And if there's one thing I know about you... You love yourself some Corinthian. Right. You just, like, you eat it up. I do. I'm like uh, Ricardo Montalban is Corinthian leather. Fine Corinthian leather. And is it, was it Lincoln's he was selling? I don't remember, but I do remember the yeah, I think it was the Lincoln Continental. Was it? I do believe. I would, that sounds right. Fine Corinthian leather. That would be an It's fine Corinthian leather. Yeah. And he said it like a vampire, yeah. which is weird. My God, we're old. The house, which was located at the northwest corner of Sherbrooke and Redpath Streets, was easily visible from either street as it had almost no front yard. 
The backyard was large and filled with trees and shrubs. In old photographs, it looks like there was a low wall, maybe a foot or two high on one side. There would have likely been a servant's entrance at the back of the house, again with the servants. You know? Yeah, this lifestyles we we just are it's foreign to us. It's not a podcaster's lifestyle. No, well not this one. No, well maybe Joe Rogan's. Yeah. Yeah. John James was a partner in the sugar refinery from 1860 to 1868. After that, he joined the Victoria Rifles, a Montreal-based infantry regiment of the Canadian Army. John James died in 1884. So his wife Ada did not remarry. She remained in the house on Sherbrook Street. Why wouldn't you? No kidding. I would like to remain in the house on Sherbrooke Street. <laughs> right? Like that sounds, we've got, a, again, we've got our Corinthian uh, pillars or whatever. We, and we've Your got fine portico. In my, my uh, effective entrance, like jackpot. Right. Ada was plagued by health problems her whole life. She suffered from jaw pain, joint pain, a problem with her leg that required a brace and a special boot, melancholia, an ulceration of the eye for which she received unsuccessful surgery. That sounds terrible. So the melancholia was probably as a result of all these other problems. No that kidding. She was Constant suffering. pain. Ulceration of the eye. That doesn't sound good. Yeah, and unsuccessful <laughs> eye surgery. Yeah, I, that can only make it worse. Did they call her Lucky? Was her name? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. No. She was regularly attended to by a family doctor, Thomas George Roddick. Ada spent winters at home in her bedroom resting and summers in sanatoriums in Canada and the United States. Bed rest was commonly prescribed in those days. I prescribed it to myself 46 years ago. Letters from Amy Redpath show that her mother often missed events because she was too ill to leave her room. That sounds like that it. That stinks. Nobody is sure what Ada was suffering from, but there's speculation that she had rheumatoid arthritis or some other autoimmune condition. That makes sense. Her condition worsened around 1898, and in a letter to her son Clifford at the time, Ada wrote, Dearest, how I miss you. I have come so dependent on you that I am lost without you. Nothing seems worthwhile without you. Your loving old mother. Well, that's kind of sad because, I mean, she is immobile. Right. Well, she could write. At least she could write. <laughs> that doesn't require mobility. That's your no. dexterity a bit. In the same year, Amy wrote of her mother that, quote, life is really a burden to her. Oh, Jesus. So, I mean, yeah, that's Ugh. a very sad thing. That's, t yeah. Amy, the oldest child and only daughter, was expected to stay home and care for her mother. She was almost always with her, either at home or accompanying her on one of her many trips to the sanatorium. Well, that sounds like a bundle of laughs. Just so much sanatorium happening, too. Well, yes, and then you're a daughter who has to take care of this woman who is not feeling well. No. And uh, your best quote about her is that life to her life is really a burden to her. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which I mean, sure. You, yeah. Again, you're wanting to go live it up on the streets of 19 oh whatever. Right. You know, like go have having your fun. Hey, hey. It was 1898. 1898. Let's party. Yeah. Right? You know, all the happenings on the streets and the carnivals and I don't know what else they had. Let's in. go watch them shovel something. Yeah. <laughs> Because well, there was I, always probably somebody shoveling something. Hey, here there's construction happening. Let's go watch. Yeah. Well, Let's go watch them build something that will but be no, you torn don't get, down in 20 years. You don't get to partake in any of that because you got to just watch your alien mom day yeah, after day. Yeah, fun. No. The second oldest, Peter, studied science at McGill University. And after his father's death, his uncle wrote to him, Oh, I have to do it in my voice. You do, you do. You are the oldest son of your generation of Red Pass and will by and by be looked up to as the chief representative of your family. You may have much influence for good or evil. I do not doubt that you will choose the good. It is your duty to cultivate to the utmost the capacity that you have. Even men who are naturally very clever seldom do much and never achieve greatness without much study and untiring industry. This sounds like a uh, origin story conversation between Lex Luthor and and his uncle. Like, you couldn't go good or bad. Yeah. I have like, Lex Luthor is the uncle. No, no, no. The, the, he's, oh, he's, I gotcha. Yeah, Lex Luthor is a child getting this imparted upon. You could do good or bad. 
bad with your life, and I suspect you will do good, but no, no. No, he didn't. Lex Luthor was bad. So Peter didn't work very much. <laughs> he spent his time visiting sanatoriums to receive treatment for sciatica. Oh my God. His uncle wrote to him in 1892. My dear Peter, I am sorry to learn that you are not able to keep continuously at your work, but as I heard two days ago that you had been out skating, your last ailment cannot have been very serious. It's rather passive-aggressive, Uncle. Right? Rather pa And if you wanted to make money in the 1800s, build a sanatorium. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> There isn't much information on the next two Red Path children, Reginald and Harold. Neither attended McGill like their other brothers. Harold was an avid sportsman who lived in Montreal, England, and eventually settled in Victoria, B.C. Reginald moved to a farm in Pincher Creek, Alberta, and became a cattle rancher. He, too, That's lived cool. in Victoria for a time. Letters show that in 1901, Reginald, who was considering expanding his ranch, was owed around $3,000 from the Red Paths family's investments. That's a lot of scratch back then. It really is. Pro probably if we were to uh, calculate that to today's currency, it was $100 billion. <laughs> no doubt. Clifford, the youngest child, was born in 1876. He was more ambitious than his older brothers. He studied at McGill University from 1896 to 1900 when he graduated with a law degree. Sweet. He went on to apprentice at Campbell, Meredith, Allen, and Haig under the supervision of James Bryce Allen. Allen agreed to supervise Clifford for a, quote, term of five years or such longer or shorter period as may be required by law to complete his clerkship. clerkship. So you had to be a clerk before you were a lawyer, I guess. I guess so. Just yeah. like articling today, I guess. A apprentice I yeah. in a lot of trades, yeah. Yeah. Learn the uh, ins and outs and of, then of lawyering and then get uh, confirmed to the Supreme Court. <laughs> Clifford and Peter Redpath often talked about business matters. Oh. In the early part of 1901, Peter was on one of his many trips to the sanatorium. Here I'm off go. to the sanatorium. There we go. Build a sanatorium. Profit. A letter from March 1901 shows that the Red Paths owed $2,200 in a special assessment property tax. The brothers were also waiting for an insurance payout on a property that burned down. The insurance company was going to pay them $30,000 less than the brothers wanted. So $37,000 less than they thought they were owed is a lot of cash. And what they thought they were owed was $38,000. <laughs> that particular property was put up for sale but Clifford and Peter hoped that the J. Redpath estate would buy out their shares before it sold. They also had a problem with another property. On March 23rd, Peter wrote, What about the Mingan Saganery? I don't know what that even what is. What the deuce is that? Yeah. When will the Bank of Montreal demand its due? Do you think there are sufficient funds at the company's disposal to pay interest on the $30,000 loan? I confess I am a little anxious in regard to this loan. At present, we seem to have cash enough in sight. Yeah, uh, so they got some money problems. My God, I love reading or hearing people talk from the 1800s and stuff. Everything, I must confess, I'm a little anxious in regards to this loan. At present, Everything's so we, formal. At present, we seem to, now it'd be like, I'm so fucking stressed, Mike. Right? Like, that would be, that's just, that's the sentence now. It, yeah. Communication is much more efficient now. Oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. I'm oh, so stressed It's out. just OMG. And then, like. <laughs> Exactly. And then the gun, and then a little sad emoji. With a dollar sign. Yeah. yeah. On April 22nd, Clifford wrote to Peter requesting that Peter give him power of attorney to sell off some shares. On April 23rd, Peter inquired whether the Mingham property was going to be sold. The April 23rd letter is the last one that's public, so we don't have what happened after that, except that Peter returned to Montreal not long after. So... Peter decided, I'm going home. Mm -hmm. I, with my tail between my legs, I need some money. I got to go have conversations with the people there yep. and hopefully get yep. some cash. Yeah, makes sense. In May 1901, Clifford left Campbell, Meredith, Allen, and Haig. He stayed at home to care for his mother and study for his bar exams. On June 11th, he paid $70, quote, deposit on his application for admission to the practice of law for examinations of July 1901. So he's planning to take his bar exams. Yeah, he, so, yeah, he's got he's got future plans. 
Exactly. Lots to do. However, on June 13th, Clifford arrived home around 6 o'clock. Peter was already there. He saw Clifford go up to their mother's room. Peter heard three gunshots, he said. He ran to his mother's room, broke down the door, and found Clifford and his mother on the floor. Both had been shot. Hmm. Rose, the servant, had also heard the gunshots and went to investigate. Someone called for a doctor, and several attended the scene. Ada was pronounced dead from a gunshot to the back of her head, and Clifford had a gunshot to his temple. He was unconscious, but still alive. He was taken to the hospital where he passed later that night. Yeah, because what kind of medical treatment did they have? A stick. Night? Yeah, <laughs> with a leech on it. <laughs> the tape to it that they put on your head. <laughs> Something like that. But okay, yeah, so I did. I deduce so far that uh, uh, mom has got the wound at the back of the head so that he would walk up, shoot her in the back of the head, and then cap himself. Why would somebody who's planning to get his law degree... He's even do paid that? his deposit. Yeah. yeah. You know, I like, don't, why would he do that? I don't know. And, and why th three gunshots? Right. Because that's guess. like, only you would have to imagine maybe one missed. But then you, if you first one missed, then mom would be like, what the fuck? And turn around. and Because you're not going to shoot yourself in the head twice. I've tried. Or right? you're not going to shoot yourself in the head and miss. Unless maybe you'd panic the first time oh that or just that would require some extreme panic is it like to your head like yeah like you'd like, yeah the early newspaper reports speculated that ada who suffered from bouts of insomnia had committed the crime hmm. the quebec daily mercury newspaper reported quote the family have refused all applications for details and every effort is being made to have as little public attention as possible drawn to the tragedy with that object in view, an effort is being made to have the inquest, a private one. And the inquest that they're talking about is that one that's going to happen the very next day. Yeah, a whole day. I mean, you don't, you don't need much time for these kind of things, Mike. It's only no. the legal process. Yeah, nor do you need a lot of time to gather evidence no, or any no, of that kind no, of stuff. Why? Dust why? for fingerprints. We should start, we should do this, uh, we should apply this technique more now. Uh, you don't even need 24 hours. Just get her done. Yeah, just get her done. <laughs> what kind of evidence do you have? I, we're just going by our guts here. Yeah, well, we got two dead people. Yeah, and we, seems, seems cut and dry to me. Right. A 12-member coroner's jury of Montreal's elite convened to hear witness statements. 12 members, they impanel a jury that quickly. Yeah, it's just, it's bonkers. The report reads as follows. The jurors viewed the body. Oh, that must have been pleasant. <laughs> it was probably still there, too. <laughs> the questioning of Peter Redpath, Thomas George Roddick, Hugh Patton, Rollo Campbell, Rosa Shallow, Charles James Fleet were taken under oath before the coroner on the 14th day of June, 1901. And they declared, respectively, the following. Mm -hmm. So here, here we're going to hear from what they said yep. in the trial. Mr. Or in the, in the inquest. Yep. Peter Redpath said, yesterday evening, I saw my brother, the deceased, arrive home at around six o'clock. He seemed ill and was tired, working hard to prepare for his bar exams. Mm -hmm. Understandable. Mm -hmm. He went up to the room of my mother, Ada Maria Mills, age 62, and a few seconds later, I heard a shot from a firearm, followed by two others. I ran up and broke down the door. I saw my mother lying on the floor and, and several feet from her, my brother also lying in a pool of blood, a revolver a foot away from him near his hand. My brother had been very nervous for some time. Hmm. Maybe the stress hmm. of this upcoming exam was getting to him. You or... know, and, and mental health, just because somebody paid a, a deposit on their uh, right. uh, degree uh, doesn't mean necessarily that yeah. you could beat that time between. Your brain can go pretty bonkers. Next to testify was a doctor, Thomas George Roddick, MD. Mm -hmm. He says, I was called upon to confirm death. He explained to the jurors the position in which he found the bodies and declared that in his mind, the son must have killed his mother and then shot himself afterward. He had known the family for some time, for about 20 years. At some time. He was aware that the son was epileptic. So Clifford was epileptic and thought he was not responsible for his acts before, during, and after the attacks. Knowing that he had attacks some time ago, Roddick had advised him to get some rest for a few days and was supposed to accompany him. 
which is very strange. So, uh, hmm. so yeah. So he's believing that Clifford shot his mom in some sort of fugue epileptic. state. Yeah. yeah, which is bonkers. But they believed in the vapors back then. So Doctor Hugh Patton said, "I arrived at the same time as Doctor Campbell." So there's three doctors there, which is kind of amazing. Why not? How can you get three doctors to your house in minutes? You, you, they probably lived in there. They're so rich. <laughs> it's such a big place. They employed three doctors at right? all times. They were the servants. I found the two bodies in the position described by the first witness. I saw two revolvers. The young man's wound was to his left temple. That of the deceased was to the back of her head. And Rollo Campbell, who's also a doctor, corroborated Dr. Patton's testimony and also added that he noticed foam in the mouth of the deceased man, a sign apparently of an epileptic attack well, or a recent one. Yeah, I, Maybe. I, I'm sure. In 1901, sure. Sure. sure that, that's a sign. Sure. Rosa Shallow, the servant, said, I heard the shots and went up right away after Mr. Peter Redpath and saw the two bodies a few feet from each other on the floor. I saw two revolvers near Mr. Clifford Redpath. Have never seen a revolver in the deceased woman's room. So two she knew. Two revolvers. Yeah, why are there two revolvers? This isn't making sense. And it makes three gunshots seem a little more like, oh, okay, almost like there was a gunfight. Right. Charles James Fleet, I'm not sure who this person is, uh, was handed the two revolvers by Dr. Campbell. And he said he locked them away and produced them here at this hearing. And it shows that two chambers in one and one in the other are empty. And he had never seen those revolvers before either. Okay, so, yep. So the verdict was, quote, We, the undersigned jurors, having heard the evidence, declare that Ada Maria Mills died at Montreal on the 13th day of June, 1901, from a gunshot wound, apparently inflicted by Clifford Jocelyn Redpath, while unconscious of what he was doing and temporarily insane, owing to an epileptic attack from which he was suffering at the time. And the weirdest thing of this whole thing is that the document was signed by the jurors and the coroner, whose name was Ed McMahon. <laughs> right? Oh, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, Johnny. Yeah. yeah very weird. This, this, whole, this whole thing is just... Uh, um, I've never heard of anybody in epilepsy committing murder. I've never heard of that. Nope. I don't think it happens. I don't think um, 24 hours is enough time to put together all of your evidence to bring forward. And the fact that they know there were two guns used. Yeah. And are just like, no big deal. It was a murder-suicide. Yeah, so happens. you need two guns for a murder-suicide. <laughs> you ever watch a Western? <laughs> like Double-handed uh, pistols. Like and... young guns. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You see the size of that chicken? <laughs> yeah. Just shooting away. Very weird. The coroner's report for Clifford is three pages long. Hey. The verdict reads, quote, We the undersigned jurors... Having heard the evidence declare that Clifford Jocelyn Redpath died at Montreal on the 13th day of June, 1901, from a gunshot wound inflicted by his own hand while suffering from temporary insanity caused by an epileptic attack for which he was suffering at the time, he being at the time unconscious of what he was doing. And the rest of the document apparently just names and signatures of the jury members, so they took three, three pages. A page per signature. Right. The results of the inquest made the headlines. The coroner's verdict left many unanswered questions. No, yes. no kidding. Mm -hmm. From the Quebec Daily Mercury, quote, The details of the tragedy were sought for in vain. At the home of the victims, no special information throwing light on the subject could be gleaned. Mrs. Redpath died instantly. Her son, with two bullets in him lingered a few hours in the hospital before his own life became extinct. The cause of the fatal shooting in each case is still a mystery, for no one seems to be living who could reveal the true origin of the double crime, matricide, and suicide. Even the investigation at the coroner's inquest unearths no clue to the dreadful deed, or what circumstances led up to its perpetration. There are surmises, of course, but surmises do not come under the category of evidence. The only cause assigned 
for the fearful episode in Montreal's social history is that the young man who killed his mother and himself was temporarily deranged at the time of shooting. To this is added the fact that he was suffering from effects of an epileptic fit which left him on the borders of insanity. Why a loaded revolver should have been so near at hand is difficult to say. Loaded revolvers are bad things to keep in one's house. In this age, there does not seem to be a justifiable reason for having them so handy, and particularly in keeping them so near at hand of a man addicted to fits, epileptic or otherwise. Talk will not restore the dead to life, but for the living, there is a lesson to be learned. Keep loaded guns out of reach. Wow. Number one, I don't like that word, epileptic fits. It's not exactly politically correct in any remote no, sense. No, you are correct. Yeah. You are correct. It is a seizure. Um, but it, it, it's kind of also interesting how even in that day and age, Canadians were like, yeah, we don't need loaded handguns <laughs> in the house. Well, what? back then, you're just it's bear attacks. In Montreal. Yeah. I think Bonhomme is the only thing that's going to be attacking you in Montreal. <laughs> no bears. The big snowman. The wild. <laughs> With the, his French hat on. <laughs> only Canadians will get that. Yeah. Only can, but they, But also they mentioned in there he had two bullet wounds to him. Which, two bullet wounds. Which wasn't mentioned before. So did he first shoot himself in the leg? And then the temple? Like, interesting. A reporter from the Ottawa Morning Herald spoke with Harold Redpath, who had seen his brother the day of the murder. Mm -hmm. Harold said, quote, I left Clifford about 8 o'clock yesterday in good spirits, though somewhat unwell. In fact, Clifford had been indisposed for some time owing to hard work preparing for his day examinations. No one knows just how the affair occurred. Clifford was particularly fond of his mother. There seems no other conclusion to come to but that, as a result of overwork, Clifford's mind became affected, and in a moment of temporary aberration, he committed the deed. I have no doubt that had he not died, he would have remembered this morning what had happened. But Dr. Roddick and the other physicians who attended Clifford say he was subject to epilepsy and that his nervous system was very much run down. Only yesterday, before I left Clifford, we were speaking of a trip to Quebec or some other resort where he might be able to study quietly. So, a lot of, yeah. A lot of quackery. Afoot. Yeah, something is, yeah. yeah, this, I don't think it went down exactly like. Dear God, no. Yeah. And we'll take a break right here. And we're back. Uh, what are your thoughts, Scott? My thoughts are that there's more to this story than we know. Because, again, two guns right there. Two. Two guns would make you go, okay, what's going on here? Yeah. What's going there? This isn't as cut and dry as uh, they want you to think. I have never heard of a murder-suicide being committed with two weapons. No, no. no. It's clear that there were two armed people. Right. To me, it's clear. There were two armed people and not the mom. Yeah, definitely not the mom. Not the mom. No. The money from Ada's estate was split equally among the surviving children. Okay. Peter went to visit yet another sanatorium to deal with the stress of the events and his other health problems. He had contracted tuberculosis several years earlier. So now he's got TB. You know. This is not a good, not a good time to be alive. No. <laughs> Although he initially survived the illness, it caused him long-term problems. Sure. He died from complications from tuberculosis in May of 1902, less than a year after Clifford and his mother's death. Hmm. Wow. Lily Dougal, Clifford's cousin, wrote a novel in 1905 called The Summit House Mystery. In England, the book was titled The Earthly Purgatory. The book is about two sisters who moved away from the city to hide from a family secret. <laughs> One sister, Hermione Claxon, is suspected of murdering her father and stepmother. Two characters discuss whether Hermione was temporarily insane. Well, now. Quote, but, oh, but, I read, I read constantly in the newspapers of people who kill themselves or kill others and themselves afterwards. The verdict is always, quote, temporary insanity. I suppose there was such a thing. And also, quote, the verdict is usually a cloak for ignorance 
but it assumes that had people lived, they would have shown symptoms of mental disease. Did Lily think Clifford was innocent when she wrote this novel? It's hard to say. The book seems to be inspired more by Lizzie Borden than by Clifford Redpath. And there's a surprise twist at the end. Hermione Claxton's father is still alive. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, spoiler. Why didn't you give us a spoiler alert? Yeah. I wanted to read that book. Yeah, I, was, I already bought it. He killed his wife and Hermione and helped them cover up the crime. If anyone wants to read this book, be aware that the language is quite offensive by today's standards. Oh. Says <laughs> Josina. Josina. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh man. So I won't read it. No, no, no. It's probably very racist and, yeah, not very forward-thinking. No. Amy went to visit with family in England before returning to live at her mother's house. She married Dr. Roddick in 1906. Oh, okay. Okay. So one of the heirs married one of the doctors who was one of the ones giving evidence saying, murder, suicide. Essentially the man who came up with the, uh, here's what happened. And like I said, how did three doctors get there so quickly? Amy eventually became a poet and a playwright. Wow. She published several works between 1918 and 1941. One of her closest companions was her servant, Rosa Shallow. So somebody else who testified... Rosa stayed with Amy until Rosa's death in 1943. And had Amy died first, Rosa would have received a yearly pension and Amy's wardrobe. A year after Rosa's death, Amy had her body moved to the Red Path family plot. So they were very close. This just is just something else. Right? Mm hmm. Murder suicide. Mm -hmm. Oh, clearly. A lot of money at stake. Yep. Hmm. Oh. Perhaps a house of conspiring folk. This is like definitely a, it's like we're watching Clue. Did Clifford suffer an epileptic attack or was epilepsy used as a defense so he would be not criminally responsible? At the time, an epilepsy defense would require the courts to deliver a verdict of not guilty or not criminally responsible based on the McNaughton rules. Quote, that every man is to be presumed sane and that... To establish defense on the ground of insanity, it must be clearly proved at the time of committing the act, the party accused was laboring under such a defect of reason from the disease of the mind as not to know the nature and quality of the act he was doing, or if he did know it, that he did not know he was doing what was wrong, end quote. If only there was a doctor involved who could uh, verify like said illness. Yeah, exactly. In the 1800s, doctors had started to link epilepsy and violence. An article from May 2020 states that in 1875, quote, Hewlings Jackson, considered one of the founding fathers of epileptology, okay. published an article, quote, on temporary mental disorders after epileptic paroxysm, uh -huh. in which he described a patient with epilepsy who exhibited episodes of violent behavior. These initial reports and others created the idea that epilepsy and recurrent epileptic seizures could be associated with violent and criminal behavior, which may have contributed to the stigma and the negative perception of epilepsy in the general population. And Josina says here, it should be noted that rates of violence in people with epilepsy are the same for people without. Yes. Just like schizophrenia, the disease doesn't make a person dangerous. Yeah, and he's basing this uh, article that he published off of observing a person. <laughs> well, I, we don't know for sure because, yeah. What is epilepsy? The Epilepsy Foundation states that, quote, epilepsy is a chronic disorder, the hallmark of which is recurrent, unprovoked seizures. A person is diagnosed with epilepsy if they have two unprovoked seizures or one unprovoked seizure with the likelihood of more that were not caused by some known and reversible medical condition like mm. alcohol withdrawal or extremely low blood sugar. The seizures in epilepsy may be related to a brain injury or family tendency, but often the cause is completely unknown. The word epilepsy does not indicate anything about the person's seizures or their severity. Mm. Many people with epilepsy have more than one type of seizure and may have other symptoms of neurological problems as well. Some common triggers include stress, sleep deprivation, drugs or alcohol, time of day, or other medications and illness. 
Seizures occur in several phases. The prodromal phase occurs in about 20% of patients. It's a pre-warning phase that can occur hours or even days before a seizure. And I know they can train dogs to watch for the prodromal Whoa, stage of seizures. That's amazing. So, certain dogs, yeah. Symptoms include anxiety, confusion, irritability, anger, as well as headaches and tremors. Hmm. Next, some people experience an aura from the UK Epilepsy Society. Quote, an aura is the term some people use to describe the warning they feel before they have a seizure. An epilepsy aura is, in fact, a focal-aware seizure. Hmm. Symptoms include, quote, a rising feeling in the stomach or deja vu, feeling like you've been there before, mm -hmm. getting an unusual smell or taste, a sudden intense feeling of fear or joy, a strange feeling like a wave going through the head, a stiffness or twitching in part of the body, such as arm or hand, a feeling of numbness or tingling, a sensation that an arm or leg feels bigger or smaller than it actually is, or visual disturbances such as colored or flashing lights or hallucinations, seeing something that it isn't actually there, end quote. That's really fascinating. It is. I did not know all of that. No, I didn't either. I've known people with epilepsy, um, but all the people I've known have it quite well managed yeah, with medication. Yeah. The middle or ictal phase of the seizure is the main seizure. This phase is different for each patient depending mm -hmm. on what type of seizure they have. A partial or focal seizure involves either the frontal lobe or one of the hemispheres of the brain. A generalized seizure involves both hemispheres. Partial or focal seizures are divided into two categories, conscious or simple partial seizures, where the person is aware of what's going on and impaired conscious or complex partial seizures where the person isn't aware of what's going on. Hmm. When we think of epilepsy, we probably think of the classic tonic-clonic seizures, formerly referred to as grand mal seizures. Oh, okay. These are the kind usually depicted in movies, but is just one of the many types of epileptic seizures. In one unusual case, the patient would, quote, speak profane language with threatened aggression, using his hands as stylized guns to track moving people and, quote, shoot them. He hmm. appeared to alter his actions in reaction to external visual and verbal stimuli. The patient was amnestic for the major portion of his seizure, so he didn't know what was mm -hmm. going on, but could accurately identify the person who questioned him during the seizure. That's fascinating. And, and terrifying, to be honest with you. Yeah. And disclaimer note uh, that seizures are different for everyone, and this behavior is no way indicative of what epilepsy looks like. Some seizures look like the person is just zoning out. Mm -hmm. The postictal phase is the period after the seizure. Some people might have amnesia, be confused, or have an altered mood state. A small percentage of people experience postictal aggression, mm. sometimes caused by fear of not knowing what's going on. Yeah. These people may appear intoxicated to the casual observer. So suddenly, in your mind, you blanked out for a few minutes mm -hmm. and you wake up confused and what the hell is going on? Yeah, yeah I, I can understand some aggression. There's some debate about whether violence committed during a seizure can be goal-oriented. Targeted aggression is most likely caused by post-ictal psychosis. If a non-psychotic patient is aggressive, it is usually when they are resisting being restrained and are frightened by the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Fair enough. Post-ictal psychosis occurs after a period of lucidity, after the seizure. It's described as, quote, fluctuating combinations of thought disorder, auditory and visual hallucinations, delusions, grandiose religious persecutory, paranoia, mania or depression, and aggression. Auditory or visual hallucinations can predominate. Religious and violent behavior can be prominent in this phase. Most sudden religious conversions in epilepsy patients occur during the post-ictal period. Hmm. Weird. Both verbal and physical violence can occur, which may be serious and life-threatening to patient or others. In one study of 43 consecutive deaths among patients, with well-characterized epilepsy, all six suicides occurred in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. Three jumped in front of a moving train during post-ictal psychosis. Oh, wow, my goodness. Wow. Other known deaths related to post-ictal psychosis include a suicide performed by jumping into the center of a stairwell from the 12th floor of an epilepsy center and a patient stabbing his wife. Hmm. That's fascinating. Well, that is really, really fascinating. The human brain is a really 
interesting. It's a terrifying organ. thing to be honest with you. That a malfunction in your brain could cause you to do some very, very strange things. Well, the responsibility the brain has on how we function is everything. And so, right. you know, it just takes a, yeah, a small anomaly in your brain and away you go. And I'm wondering what where all those brain cells that I destroyed went. It's not good. Mm. Between 1975 and 2001, there were 13 cases in England and Wales where a defendant successfully used an epilepsy defense and was found not criminally responsible. My God. The crimes range from break and enter to murder. In 12 out of the 13 cases, the defendant displayed, quote, behavioral manifestations suggestive of epileptic seizures, impaired awareness, inappropriate gestures, stereotype movements, irrelevant replies, aimless wandering, and vacant expression. That sounds like you. <laughs> Shortly after the time the offense was committed. I've got to be honest, I'm blown away that there are actual Successful cases. defenses. Yeah. yeah. Although there are a large number of studies about epilepsy and criminal behavior, there is a debate whether other comorbidities, such as inherited mental illness or substance abuse, could be responsible. Yeah, uh, absolutely. The Canadian Mysteries website, which is where I found this story and sent it to Josina, gathered interpretations of the case from several different people, including forensic psychologist Dr. Rene Fuguer. Oh, yeah. In her opinion... If the information available about the case is true, then Clifford did kill his mother, then himself, while experiencing an epileptic seizure. The full interpretations from CanadianMysteries.ca are password protected, although it's easy to apply for one. One of the interpretations on CanadianMysteries.com is written by historian Rod McLeod. He wrote a scenario in which Clifford shot his mother because she couldn't accept that he was gay. This theory has made its way online, but it should be noted that it is meant to be a possible scenario based on the social norms of the day rather than a historical account based on the limited evidence available. I think that's why these are password protected because they don't want people to grab a hold of something and say, this is what happened. Yeah. yeah but yeah. it's it's just a scenario that an academic is writing. Yeah. yeah it, may, it makes sense. But it, like none of what we're reading about the possibility epilepsy may have played in the murder explains the two guns. No, it doesn't. No. So, did Clifford kill his mother during an epileptic seizure? It is entirely possible if the known facts are true. There's just enough loose ends in the case to make one wonder. Yeah. And why didn't anybody call the cops? <laughs> like, okay, there's three gunshots. You go up, you find your brother's bleeding really badly, and there's mom dead. Mm -hmm. My first thought is we need to call the police. The, uh, we need to, yeah, we need to let the authorities know what's happened and let them, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let them sort it out yeah. kind of thing. So why not? That doesn't make any sense. I'm trying to envision the time. I'm trying to envision 1901. Maybe it was common if it's just like, well, they're dead, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, it, like, like, or, well, I guess Clifford wasn't dead at that time, but right. yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. It, it, to me, it seems like you only wouldn't contact the authorities if you yeah. don't want the authorities involved. Right. If you have something to hide. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, why did Peter say he saw one gun instead of two? Is he a reliable witness? You know what? Maybe he just didn't see it. Maybe it's laying beside somebody yeah. else yeah. further away enough that... He just didn't notice it. Yeah, you're going to be in a panicked state. Mm -hmm. If you are innocently stumbling across the scene, you're going to be very panicked. Did Lily Dougal, the writer of that novel later on, know something? Because there are two girls who move away from home, but there were two brothers. So has she changed the names? It, it seems uh, you write what you know. Right? It's interesting. Mm -hmm. And if someone wanted Ada dead... Why not make her death look like natural causes? Oh, this is a great question. So I don't know. Yeah. Great question. So here's the thing. Like, it's very, very interesting that the daughter, Amy, ends up marrying the doctor who was first oh. on the scene kind of thing. Oh, it's very, very uh, suspicious. I mean, my God, you could see it two very clearly distinctive ways. You could see it that... There were multiple people, including the doctor and the daughter, mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, 
Peter. Uh, there, there are other family members. Their family. There were people there who were involved. In the not nanny. The the help. The servant. Yeah. The servant. Rosie. Yeah. Where where they conspired and put a plan together to off them to you, collect yeah. the inheritance and blame you say it this and, and I say yeah that. blame it on back then it wouldn't sound as ludicrous as it sounds now because you didn't have the forensic capabilities and you'd be way like it would be a plausible thing to do but on the other hand uh, it could have been a murder suicide and then all of this trauma bonded all these people together. That's why she ends up totally. marrying because yep. they've known her for so long and they, he, he helped her uh, deal with the tragedy. And then the house ke- or the, the servant was, you know, also trauma. Like it could have just pulled people together and bonded them and brought them. Cl- the one factor that just keeps standing out for me is the two guns. Yeah. That does not make sense as to why. And in the same vein, Though, like that could also support the murder suicide because if the f- people were all involved in this, yeah, and the police weren't there, wouldn't you go, oh shit, let's just hide the other gun? Because then if you're saying like, yeah, there were two guns, that only makes it more. Yeah, I don't know. Wow, you stumped me, Josina. <laughs> so to read more, go to CanadianMysteries.ca. Yeah, it's a very interesting one. Mm-hmm. It's a very interesting. So there you go, yeah. the Red Path Mansion murders, and people have asked us to cover this oh, a number they? of times. Yeah. yeah, so I've thought covered. Yeah, it's time done. covered. You're welcome, people. Done and done. Uh, well, that's it for this week's case. Yeah. So I guess it's time for our voicemails. It's a dilly of a pickle. You can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. And if your call stands out, you might hear it on the show. So let's have a listen to a few of the voicemails that have come in over the interwebs <gasps> over to, uh, that have come in over the telephone which Scott thinks they didn't have in 1901 but uh, yeah let's 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 have a peek Hi Mike and Scott my name's Jeff I'm calling from beautiful windy Winnipeg Manitoba I've listened to your podcast basically from the start I felt uh after World Mental Health Day, it was extremely important for me to call and tell you how much I appreciate your podcast, how much empathy and compassion that you show for the victims. I also appreciate how the both of you seem to have a true connection and friendship. Uh, I feel sometimes like I'm listening to family when I listen to you. So (laughs) apologize for the mushy stuff. I wanted to call and make some funny accent or or maybe do your old man voice, but I don't really think at this point I'm up to that. I also promised myself that I would not tell you both to go shit in your hat, so I promise that I won't do that, but I think I may just have done that. So anyways, boys, uh, from one uh, Canuck in the Prairies to you both on the West Coast, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, Keep making people happy with your content. And take care of yourselves and your families. I think now more than ever, we all need to do that for each other. So, doodles. Thanks, Jeff. That oh, was awesome. That was a great voicemail, Jeff. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you left it exactly as you did because yeah. that's really, really nice to hear. And as big mental health uh, sufferers, <laughs> we're also advocates of it and really, really appreciate that uh, that and, call. And that uh, you say you hear like a true friendship between Scott and I. That's it's not fake. the case. It's That's fake. not the case. Yeah. <laughs> fuck, fuck Mike. <laughs> Aw. <laughs> No, just, the, no, the good fuck. My poor, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that either. My poor little heart just broke a little bit. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh. And then I stepped on it. Then you stepped on it and it was ugly. <laughs> it just got ugly over. Yeah. It happens, people. Yeah. Deal with it. All right. Let's listen to, uh, oh, this one's from the United States of America. Oh. Well, let's have a listen to this one. Hi, guys. This is Annie calling from St. Louis in the States. I was curious. I've been listening to your podcast for a while, and I know that the U.S. is over punitive with their uh, criminal justice system. People get really harsh sentences for really silly things. But I feel like listening to a lot of Canadian crime, um, it's almost the opposite. And I was just wondering how you two felt about that when people who've committed really egregious murders are going to prison for 
really short periods of time. I just was curious about your opinion. Um, my second question was whether or not you all have extra space for some uh, poutine lovers down here in the U.S. who may need to be heading up north after November, depending on how this election goes. So <laughs> looking forward to maybe seeing y'all in person. And I've learned a lot from this podcast that will hopefully help me blend in with other Canadians. <laughs> If I need to escape the U.S. Anyway, uh, go ahead and uh, shit in your hat, I guess. That's what you say. Bye. <laughs> well, well, Thanks, Annie. Wow, Annie. Uh, so uh, let's answer question number two first. Come on over. So, well, yeah. If you stick around and help to fix it, it'll get fixed. One can hope. One can hope. One can hope. I don't think you need to give up on that country that you're in. I think there are some very good folks down there who but, wanna yeah. who wanna make stuff right again. But I can who imagine who wanna make America right again. <laughs> but or I maybe uh, left again. I, but I get it. I get um, when you're living there, it must be bloody overwhelming because yeah. it is outside of there. So in it, it must we're be. here to support you. Yeah, absolutely. And question number one, mm -hmm. she was asking us. How we feel about light sentencing, Scott? Yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting. I think, um, I don't know if there really is a, a, a difference between the sentencing of, of oh, difficult crimes here than there. I know the smaller stuff. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're, we, we, Canada is much different in uh, drug-related crimes and, and stuff like that. Um, uh, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I try to have a lot of faith in our judicial system. And I try to understand that the lenient sentencing is coming from a place of genuine want of rehabilitation and understanding somebody's psyche. Um, but none of that means anything when you're the victim. You know, and so it, it's just so difficult to separate the two. I, I know that, I, I've, as I've said a million times, if something were to happen to one of my family members, yeah, uh, a light sentence would make me flip tables and hate the judicial system. Right. But I have to try to also recognize, though, that it's the courts aren't just like, oh, we don't care, like murder, just let people out. It, yeah. the, the sentencing is done for a reason. But again, that doesn't mean shit when it's yeah, your family we, who's because we don't understand it yeah ah uh, all right let's listen to this one just, let's listen to this one just for fun hi mark and scott um just finished listening to the most recent podcast uh, thank you for bringing me through this covid shit uh, one more person that you got through this um i'm a trucker from quebec and uh Really, really enjoy uh, everything you do. Uh, seriously, uh, Scott, keep gibbering on, and Mike, keep on bringing those nice stories. Uh, you really make awesome time of it. Listening to you guys is just so priceless. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Wow. I love that. I, lo I love it I when our callers from Quebec and they're not hateful to us. <laughs> because of our pronunciation. Because of our terrible pronunciations of some uh, French words. But, but that, uh, I, I love that message. And I have just like so much respect for, for truckers. Right now, especially. Yeah. Like, the unsung heroes uh, keeping our supply chain open. Go, yeah, ab yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's... Um, it's not an easy job. You're spending a lot of time away from family mm -hmm. and friends, a fairly nomadic life. Yeah. Which I mean, can be, for some of us, it can be what wonderful, but like, that's a, that's a tough job. And I, I think that I, I understand like they, they need something to, to be playing while they're out there going about. And it's nice that we can, uh, and he said that you gibber, Ooh, and I tell nice stories. So. He's very accurate. <laughs> There's nothing he's wrong very, with that assessment. Very, uh, I, <laughs> I, am, I, I, I support my gibber. Yep, you're a professional gibberer. And a jabber sometimes. Sometimes you jab. More jibbing. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's listen to this one. It looks like it's somebody from quite a ways away. Oh, my goodness. Let's have a listen. Mm -hmm. It may not be because... Translate. Because translate sucks. But uh, yeah, let's have a listen. Hi, Mike and Scott. Uh, this is Adrian calling from all the way over in Norway. Uh, I'm just going to say I enjoy your show very much. Uh, I always listen when there's a new episode out. And 
I just really enjoy how open you are about your own experiences and how much compassion you show uh, with every case you cover. Uh, and who knows, maybe one day we'll have a uh, away game from Norway. I uh, hope you're good. Uh, look forward to listening to future episodes. And go shit in your hat. Or in Norwegian, go all dritt i hatten din. Goodbye. <laughs> well, there you go. We got told to go shit in our hats in Norwegian. That was amazing. You know, I, I, uh, I've i watched a few programs on Norwegian uh, true crime and stuff like that, and it is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. It would be neat to do an away game from there. Well, there's one particular case that I do want to cover from there, and it's probably the one that everybody thinks that I would want to cover, and it is. So, uh, yeah. Which one? Anders Breivik. Anders Breivik, yeah. yeah. I'd be really interested in covering that one day. Just just so I can explore it myself. Yeah, man, that one yeah. is bloody heavy. Yeah. Um, and my friend Morten, he's Norwegian, mm -hmm. uh, birth. He moved here in his 20s, I believe, maybe okay. his 30s. But he told me that he used to go to the camp oh, on that wow. island. Wow. He was a part of that political yeah, yeah. party yeah. as well. Yeah. So he would go to that camp on that island when he was a young boy. That's another in, example in Toya, of, a, yeah. of a white extremist. Right. Anyway, that's it for voicemails for this week. Whoa, that was uh, those were some goodies. Yeah, those were. I enjoyed those. Yeah, we had uh, quite a quite a mixed it bag. Ran, it ran the gamut. It did. If you want to leave us a voicemail, don't forget you can leave us one at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six, or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N, and make it stand out so. Uh, we'll so, hear it on the show. Yeah, you want it. You want it played. Well, I guess that means it's time. For Patreon shoutouts. Okay, hold on. Let me get my brain going here. You, oh, Scott, Scott's got to pry it open before we actually <laughs> right. get going. Okay. All, right. Because, uh, All right, brain's uh, at 10% uh, functioning capabilities. Right. If that. Yeah, I was being, I was giving myself a benefit of the doubt. Very generous with yourself. I was trying to be. <laughs> we have. From London, Ontario, Ew. Cindy Chappelle. Cindy Chappelle. Related to Dave, do you nope, think? Nope, no, nope, no, nope, oh, That's nope. too bad. Yeah, gets uh, asked that a lot. Mm -hmm. And will throat punch people when they ask. Oh, that's not good. Well, I mean, you can understand. You can get I do, you, yeah. You can get that, yeah. Yeah, I got yeah. Michael Michael Motorcycle when I was a kid. What an amazing nickname. What did you get? Scott the Snot, or uh, I got I got uh, Dumbo a lot because my ears are average size now, but that's because I grew into you them. Grew they into were them. this size. My my I got Dumbo a lot. I got Scooter a lot. Yeah, uh, Scooter's good. Yeah, though. I didn't wasn't get I didn't get a lot of nicknames. Pee wee, so what, pee wee, and in, in when I played rugby. So what what Cindy's bag? What does she do? What's funny? You mentioned bags. She's a bag salesperson. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. At um at um Bentley Bags. Wow. Yeah. 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 She sells Bentley bags at Bentley bags. There you go. In very high end, very high end. Um, uh, sometimes she previously worked at, at coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a profitable industry. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So if you need, if anybody needs a bag in London, Ontario, you know who to reach out to. I don't know which part of the island my accent is from, <laughs> but our next patron is named Tracy McLean, and she's from Belfast in Ireland. Yeah, that's that's they have one of those in Ireland. Though. They do have a Belfast yeah, they, there. Yeah, they've relocated it there, yeah. Why, they're always after me lucky charms. They, <laughs> why, is everyone, oh. why does everyone laugh when oh, they say that? Well, because uh, they're magically delicious. So what does Tracy McLean, we Tracy McLean, do in... In Ireland. So, in Ireland, Tracy McLean is a, a, a taxi driver. Oh, she drives a taxi. But out in, in, in the UK, like, that's a legit trade. It's not grand. Yes. It's a, it's a legit trade. It's not just... In Belfast, it's a legit trade. Yeah. It's not like you're oh. just, it's not like you're just like, well, fine, I'll be a taxi driver then. Like, it's a, like, you've got to know your stuff and, and it's considered a, a good career. So, Tracy McLean's out there just kicking kicking taxi ass 
Well, aren't we glad that that's what she's doing? People need to get to and fro, Mike. They do. They they, they do. They, they need, definitely do. People need to be placed all across this wonderful Belfast of they theirs. They need to be driven to the end of the rainbow to find that, that pot of gold. Yeah, there's a lot of gold. Apparently. There's a lot of gold. Next we have from Siren, Wisconsin. Whoa. Jamie Vander Velden. Yep. Vander what Velden. a great name. It really is, isn't it? Jamie Vander Velden. Hello, I'm calling on behalf of Jamie Vander Velden. You really do get the sense that it would be a royalty. A royalty. Yes. Absolutely. And what does Jamie Vander Velden, what does she do in Siren, Wisconsin? So what Jamie does, Jamie is a stay-at-home nurse. Oh, she's, how do you, I don't know how that works. She just stays home. She just, yeah, she just. Does she, she get paid? She does, yeah. For staying at home? Yeah. Oh, yeah. she's a bad nurse. <laughs> oh, gosh, I hope she's not a nurse. Because we have actually had people say, yeah, that's what I do. Oh, my God. Yeah, a couple of times. That's amazing. Yeah, it's not good. Oh, well, sure it is. <laughs> so she's a stay-at-home nurse? She's a stay-at-home nurse, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, but so it's not what you think. I know where you said, I know what you're thinking. Uh, she takes care of other nurses. Oh. So she goes to nurses' homes. Not nursing homes. Not nursing homes, nurses' homes. And but just, how is she and staying at home then? Uh, she's staying at their home. Ah, there's a trick to this. this see, you get it? You get it? I got it. She goes to their home and stays with them. Wow. I yeah, know, and helps them out with well, whatever good they for need. her. It's, yeah, somebody's got to do this. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. Somebody is doing it. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, next up, from this little town close by. I think I've heard of it. Vancouver, British Columbia. It's ringing a bell. We have Danielle Swift. Yeah. It's another great name. Wow. Danielle Swift. Coming hard with the great names. And people. what does Danielle do? So Danielle works in Stanley Park. Okay. Uh, forest fire prevention. Um, right. As we've heard other people who might lead other countries say, one of the best ways to try to manage forest fires is raking uh, the the forest. Yeah. Oh, so she rakes. She rakes the she rakes Stanley Park. Picks wow. up all the debris because you know fires, lightning, and stuff like that. Somebody might be saying in another country uh, that leads it that that's how forest fires start because poor floor management. And so uh, that's what she does. That's fantastic. She's, she, you, any time of the day, you go out there, you look hard enough, you'll find her raking uh, leaves in the forest. Oh, boy. Mm-hmm. Stay. So have, you seen, have you seen Stanley Park catch on fire recently? Nope. Exactly. Next, we have Natalie Wanless. Hey, Mike and Scott. I've been listening to Dark Poutine since I moved to Vancouver from Manchester uh, in the UK oh. two years ago. I told myself that once I'd cut up and listen to every episode, I'd send you some Timbit money to say thanks for all the education and entertainment. Oh. Thank you for teaching me about the more interesting side of my new home. It'll be on the citizenship test, right? No, I highly doubt <laughs> that. All the best, Natalie. P.S. Are we ever going to get Go Poop in Your Toque merch? I'm thinking about it. And she asked, hopefully, by the way, my surname is pronounced Wanless. Which oh, is how yeah. you said it. Yeah. Well done. I would have been Wanless. Well, there you go. Yeah. That's why I don't pronounce the names. <laughs> Next we have from Apple Hill, Ontario. But wait, don't we want to do Natalie's oh, job? Oh, right. Yeah. What the hell? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Poor Natalie. She. So what does Natalie do? Natalie Wanless. Natalie. What does she do? So Natalie is a car stereo installer. She builds out those booming systems. Oh, like you used to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She makes those booming systems. All those cars that drive by you and it's <laughs> that that she probably put it in there and you hate her. But I love her because this, I, I love that uh, field and I love I love booming systems. Right. But so, yeah, she's a she's she car audio installer. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you for, I guess, for doing that, Natalie. Yeah. Next up, we have from Apple Hill, Ontario, oh. also in Canada, mm -hmm. Catherine Maud. Well, hi, Catherine. What does Catherine do? Catherine um, uh, makes mayonnaise. What? Mm -hmm. Homemade mayonnaise and sells it. 
It's, it's good stuff. Have you tried it? I have not tried homemade mayonnaise. It's called modernaise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a delicious, delicious. So it's specific to her recipe. Yeah. Yeah. It's custom made. Uh, yeah. There yep. you go. Yeah. It's so good. It's so it's good. It's bespoke mayonnaise. <laughs> it is. It, it, and she she will customize it as you wish. $100 a jar. What color is it? Uh, it's white. Well, that's boring. Oh, it, but it's, it's not about the f- color. It's about the flavor. Oh, sweet jibbers. It's amazing. It's worth $100. I'll give her $200 for a jar. And we have our usual monthly, Irene <laughs> Brianne. Thank you very much, Irene. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yeah. You are a rock star and a roll star I, it, as well. It's amazing. You do both quite well. Amazingly. Thank you to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your help to keep us doing what we do. And if you want to help keep Dark Poutine going, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. And we did have somebody actually send us a little bit of a cash infusion what? Via um, Interact. Get out of So here. an email money transfer. Whoa. Which is unusual because we don't usually see that. Yeah. So this one is from Elana Clayton. She says, hi, Mike and Scott. I got Spotify in August and discovered podcasts. I've been obsessed with dark poutine and I listen to you guys while driving to and from work every day. You guys are amazing. Enjoy the donuts. Love Ilana from Ontario. And what does Ilana do in Ontario? Funnily enough, Mm -hmm. uh, she's a delivery driver. Oh, she's a delivery driver. Yeah, so she's because like, she, she's driving to work, and then her work is also driving. It's right. just an excessive amount of driving for her, but she loves it. She's always telling me how much she loves it and gives her so much time for podcasts and just fun, you know, lots of laughing and driving and bringing stuff to people. How why would how could you not enjoy that? Here's uh, your package, sir. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. So thank you so much for your. Your email money transfer. Yeah. It was unexpected, and we loved it. We did. We did love it. We really it. did. Thank we you. We really did. Uh, yeah. And uh, if you don't already subscribe to... Th- Actually, here's a here's a little funny thing. Oh, A little whoa. funny aside. Oh. I was doing some radio with Alan Warren today. Yeah. Uh, we were talking to a guy who... His book is about uh, a man in the United States who's about to get out of jail. And it's oh, called okay. Woman Woman Killer. Uh, uh, oh, and his name is Rod Sadler. And so Rod was telling us about his story. And then later on, Alan and I were talking and Alan has released his book mm-hmm. about a man who's about to get out of jail, possibly, mm-hmm. uh, David Shearing, mm-hmm. well, now David Ennis. And Alan said, oh, I was Googling myself and I ended up on this website. And the website is murder, murder dot news. <laughs> And on murdermurder.news, they do uh, a YouTube crime show and all this kind of stuff. And I was looking just on the site because Alan said they'd mentioned him. And it just so happens their favorite true crime podcasts, number two on their list is Dark, Dark Poutine. <laughs> so I just thought that was kind of funny. That is so cool. Right? Well, thank you, Murder Murder News. Yeah. Murder Murder.news. So uh, wow. if, if you two are listening, there you go. There's that a little is, little shout out and a, a thank you for uh, putting our show at the top yeah. of your list. We really appreciate that. That is really cool. It doesn't mean you love us the most, but hey, no, it's it does. there. It does. I'm going with that because it makes me feel better. Right. They love us the most. It looks like uh, alphabetically. They- <laughs> nope. Nope. They did go out. Nope. They love us the most, Mike. We're, I'm sticking with this. <laughs> We're number two on their list. They love us the most. And that makes me feel better. There you go. Yep. So thank you, Murder Murder dot News. Yeah. Yeah. Many thanks. There you go. Um, Next time, choose a name with A. <laughs> we'll be their number one. Right. A, 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 Murder Podcast. <laughs> If you don't already subscribe to our show, it mean a lot to us. If you did, you can easily find us on any podcatcher that where you usually find your podcasts. Check out our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Please take a time to give a like or a follow to, uh, on Facebook and Instagram to Dark Poutine. Most importantly, thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful Tis. thing. It is. 
Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.